Good afternoon. It's Anthony Clark from Small Talk Daily coming to you live from Cape Town. The noonday gun has just uh, shot at uh, 12 o'clock. So this Rand Swiss uh, webinar on small to mid cap companies is getting underway. Firstly, my uh, kind thanks to Gary and to Pascal for organizing this. I'm hoping the participants who are listening in on Zoom uh, get some uh, interesting information and some color on some very topical stocks in the segment that I cover. Uh, I'm currently in reporting season. Now, if anyone out there has never been in reporting season in financial markets, you know it's complete insanity, uh, where pretty much all the companies try and get their interim or final results out. There's always trading updates, uh, webinars, results presentations, management meetings, and you simply can never get everything done. So in my case, as I tell my institutional clients, if Anthony is quiet, and uh, you see no written content. It's not that he's not busy. It means he's so busy, he can't get written content out. And uh, you can see in my desk, uh, just on the side there, the piles of working files that I have on the go of all the companies that I visited uh, recently. And there's another huge pile on the floor behind me with a dog hopefully sleeping away. So I think what I'm going to run through in the next hour or so are some of the topical points but I have seen in the reporting season and some of the major events that have actually occurred that probably impact your life, uh, and some of which uh, are perhaps slightly perplexing. And I'll give you a real topical one that's uh, occurred in the last uh, week and a half, but it's actually been unfolding since February this year. Um, last Monday, anyone who owned PSG shares would have suddenly found out that they were receiving a number of smaller stakes in a number of the subsidiaries that PSG actually owned. Now, PSG, as a financial services empire, best known for its stake in Capitec, which it unbundled a few years ago, uh, basically decided in March this year to uh, make an offer to buy back the company. The family basically had had enough, and they were going to unbundle many of the stakes that they owned in JSE-listed companies. Stakes, for example, like Kuro Holdings, the school company, Stadio, the tertiary education company, CANS, which is an African-based uh, FMCG business. They also distributed their stake in Carp Agri, uh, a Western Cape and national-based retailer. And uh, they also unbundled their majority stake in PSG Consult, which, as many of you know, is a financial services advisory business uh, with a nationwide presence. Now, that announcement, which occurred in uh, early March, caused the share price to run quite aggressively as at one point, PSG was trading a discount to its underlying valuation of nearly 40%. And you know, the Moutons, uh, who have run this company since its foundation in 1996, initially under the patriarch, Yanni Mouton, and latterly under his son, Pitt, had clearly become disenchanted with the underlying mechanisms of being listed in the JSE and the respective uh, discounts that many of their assets were trading under. But saying that, as I'm sure many of you will understand, uh, industrial holding companies, which were the flavor of a month, uh, perhaps 20 years ago, now all traded material discounts because investors want their own decision which touch point to actually invest in. They don't necessarily want to be in a basket of goods chosen by a third party, which probably also gets a management fee for handling that. So a week last Monday, you all got uh, shares in Stadio, in Kuro, in PSG Consult, Carp Agri, and CANS. And if any of you uh, were like my institutional clients who are calling me uh, saying that they've, all of this stock is suddenly hitting their accounts, they didn't know what to do, which was not unsurprising to me. Everybody knows PSG. It was a, a large business at one point worth north of 60 billion rand. Uh, it then unbundled Capitec. Its market value was around 11 billion. And they decided, as I said, to unbundle and take themselves private, buying up a minority rump at 23 rand a share post the, um, the unbundling of the assets. I'm just going to close my screen here. So we now end up with lots of small stakes in companies which many of the institutions and perhaps many of the private individuals out there were unfamiliar with. And I'll start with the, the most unfamiliar, uh, which is basically Carp Agri. Now, Carp Agri is a stock that I've discussed on this platform before, and it's probably one of my favorite edu uh, ad um, ad sorry, agricultural counters. See, I'm tongue-tied now because I haven't had my coffee yet. It's currently trading 
at, uh, I'm looking at my list here at uh, 35 Rand 35. The share price is off year to date about 26% because there was an interesting angle regarding Carp Agri. Uh, at the end of February, Zeta Investments, uh, which was the largest shareholder in Carp Agri with 42%, announced it was, it was unbundling its stake. And as such, PSG, who was the largest shareholder in Zeta, also gained a 20% stake. So you've had all of these unbundlings weighing on the share price as a total of 32 million shares at a 74 million listed suddenly hits the market. Now, with a company like Carp Agri, which is valued at about 2.8 billion rand, which has been around for over 100 years and is a very strange hybrid business involved in agriculture and retail, but a very, very few analysts who have actually covered the company uh, to, to a level of depth that I have. I first became involved with Carp Agri 17 years ago when it was a very small little uh, over-the-counter business operating purely in the Western Cape. Uh, Zeta Investments got involved and took a stake because at that stage, Carp Agri had a very interesting asset base. It was a single largest shareholder in the unlisted Pioneer Foods. And, th and that's what PSG and Zeta wanted to get their hands on to extract that value from Carp Agri, spin it off, which they did, and they, then, and they eventually sold it. Uh, some of you may know about two years ago to PepsiCo for 26 billion rand. You could have bought uh, Carp Agri back in the day for the equivalent of 31 cents, showing you how far the stock has come as a uh, corporatization and operational efficiencies into a more normalized corporate structure actually plays out of the company. So why am I favoring Carp Agri as it stands right now? One, the share price uh, from when I've been recommending it, which was November 2020, has gone from 23 rand to a high of uh, 54 rand. It's then fell back to a recent low of about 35 rand, all because of the liquidity event surrounding the PSG and Zeta unbundling. The company is not that well known in the marketplace, even amongst institutional investors. Uh, there are many common uh, misnomers about the company. There, there are concerns about the size of its debtor book. There are concerns about its, its agricultural exposure. There are concerns that it's, it's, a, it's basically a mass market retailer. All of those are basically true, but you actually have to understand the underlying nuances of what an agricultural business actually is. For example, there was a lot of confusion this week regarding its debtor book. Now, its debtor book is a function of it lends money to farmers. So they can actually go out and buy fertilizer, seed, and all the underlying uh, requisites needed to plant uh, their crops. Uh, as such, Carp actually takes what's called a lien or surety against that crop and their farm and other assets, which means if anything goes wrong, there's actually recourse from Carp Agri to actually recover any bad and doubtful debt. I can tell you in the many years that I've covered this stock, their bad and doubtful debt provision has been below 0.5% of the overall debtors book. There isn't a retailer in this country that has a bad and doubtful debt record as good as that. I'm sure the likes of back in the day an Edcon or a Truworths or a Fashini would kill to have a, a debtor ratio that low because farmers do generally tend to pay back the money. Crops do grow. Sometimes they don't grow as well and they don't grow as, as bountiful, but crops do grow and jet, jet generally gets repaid. And the money they do lend to farmers generally gets recycled in the system because the farmer then generally spends the money that is extended to them in, in the form of, uh, of, of, of credit lines back inside the greater Carp Agri network, buying, as I said, the, the, the requisites, the, the capital equipment, the seeds, the fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm utterly unbothered if that's a bad grammatical term regarding the concerns about the carp agri data book. To me, it's, it's, a, it's a non issue. Uh, unless it was a biblical plague proportion, or as I call it, a nuclear event where the entire food production of a country was suddenly wiped out, uh, yes, it would be a bad debt issue. But then, quite frankly, no one would care because we'd all be starving. So I'd, I don't see the debt issue in carp agri as of any material concern. As it stands right now, the company is quite well organized between four distinct silos, fuel, agriculture, retail, and general retail. So for an example, there have been concerns regarding the fuel element inside Carp Agri. It spent 1.1 billion rand in November 2021 uh, buying a business called Peg Holdings. 
They own about 43 nationwide major service stations on the material arteries around this country. So if you were driving from Johannesburg to Durban in your holiday or from Johannesburg to Cape Town or any of the major long distance end routes in this country, you probably see a Shell Ultra City or one of these large fuel stations on the side of a highway and you'd naturally fill up at those because there's nothing within uh, you know, many, many miles or kilometers. Uh, you'd go to the shop, you'd use a bathroom, you'd buy your wife something, the kids would want a, an ice cream or, or, or a burger and you pay. And the prices at these uh, highway uh, outlets do not tend to be the cheapest. And interestingly, PEG, 60% of its profit doesn't come from fuel. It comes from selling convenience foods and convenience products. So what you're basically buying is a store which just happens to sell fuel on the side of a road with nothing else around it. So I think that's a fairly good business to be in longer term. The agricultural sector has been a fairly consistent performer. Um, I was at a conference last week in, uh, in Bredeersdorp at the National um, Agricultural Fair in the Western Cape, and they're forecasting a 26% rise in the greater Western Cape agricultural output over the next five years, of which a prime beneficiary will be Carp Agri, given this, is, given this is its home base. On an earnings perspective, Carp Agri had a, a 10 month trading update a couple of weeks ago. And if you take that midpoint, they will earn a minimum of five rand 65 a share. Now based on the current share price, that's a forward PE to September of 6.3 times. On my minimum forecast earnings for September 2023, that falls to 5.5 times. Now I've covered this stock for 17 years. This is the lowest rating I have seen to this stock in over a decade. This from a company that has consistently delivered CAGR or compound average growth rates of 15% per annum for the last 10 years. There was only a blip during the COVID period, but we can, we can forgive it for that because everybody was in the same basket. But earnings didn't fall back materially. So I see Carp Agri right now as one of the most compelling buys uh, in the food and agricultural sector. And many of my large institutional clients have uh, agreed with me. So there's been significant trade in carb agri. But the reason why I think the share price will remain fairly muted in the near term is, as I mentioned earlier, all of those shares for a PSG and bundling have to find a home within all the shareholding base and the institutions. Carb agri told me that with the unbundling, they will have 15,000 shareholders owning less than 100 shares and 6,000 shareholders owning less than one share. So there's going to be enormous volatility and, and flux in the share price as all of these new shareholders decide, do they actually want to hang on to this thing? Do they want to buy more or just sell them? So I would use the current volatility in the share price to actually accumulate a position for the longer term. Uh, I have a target price of Carp Agri at 64 Rand, which might seem quite aggressive, but this is a company which histor has historically traded on a rating of between eight and nine times. So if my forecast number for next year starts coming into play of 650, the market starts looking forward into 2024, I think that number is easily achievable. Even if it gets to 50 rand from a current share price, I would take that rise any day of the week. So Carp Agri right now is one of my compelling and strongest buys uh, from my desk. Another sip of coffee. The second strongest buy I have currently in the sector is one that might surprise many of you. It's a company that initially did fantastically well upon its listing and then rapidly fell from grace as it overextended its underlying uh, footprint, took on too much debt and consistently missed its uh, earnings promises. And that company is Kura Holdings, the schooling business, which PSG bought a 50% stake of uh, Dr. Chris van der Merwe, the founder, some 20 years ago, the 50 million rand. At its peak of its power, back in 2015, the company was worth 20 billion rand, and it was trading just shy of 60 rand a share. Uh, in the COVID pandemic, the Kuro share price fell to 4 rand 62, showing you how far the company had crashed, and it consistently missed investors' earnings profile. Now, I've covered this company for the best part of 15 years. And for me to come out right now and say that Kuro to me at uh, 8 Rand 89 uh, is a compelling proposition, uh, is an extremely bold statement. 
Uh, year to date, uh, the company has gone nowhere. It's down about 30%. And I've just written an education feature for the Financial Mail, which will be out probably uh, the middle of next week, which I urge you all to read if you can, where I compare all five education stocks, which is basically Kuro, Stadio, Advertech, and the smaller educational periphery stocks, which is Trematon and latterly Novus. From memory, uh, I did an update on the education sector for the, for the financial mail, February 2021. And my top buy at that point was Stadio. My second best buy was Advertech. And lastly, I had Coro saying it's not going to go anywhere because of the disappointments. From memory, Stadio was up 68%, Advertech 56%, and Coro was down 7%. So my long distance crystal ball uh, turned out to be correct. I have just changed my educational ranking for the first time in three years. My number one buy is Curro. My number two buy is Stadio. My number three buy is Advertech. Not that I believe that Advertech is a bad company. It certainly isn't. It is a mature, highly cash generative business with ongoing organic growth in this country and very strong growth into Africa. However, my sole aim as an institutional analyst is to try and give the best money-making ideas to my clients. And on a relative valuation and in an earnings perspective, I believe that Kuro in the next 18 to 24 months will significantly outperform its peer comparatives purely because of a J-curve effect at last kicking in to a company which has for years missed its earnings. Now, why am I so confident? Interim results to June came out and they were 27.5 cents a share, a rise like and like of 41%. All the issues that the education sector has faced in the last few years are behind it. The costs of major closure and downtime due to the COVID pandemic, the increased costs of PPE, the rising bad and doubtful debts because during the height of a pandemic, parents simply couldn't pay for their schooling or perhaps didn't want to pay. So there's been a whole scale clean out of what I would call the delinquent payers and the books of all the education companies are now very much better and back to pre pandemic levels. So I'm now unconcerned regarding the data books of the free companies. In Kuro's case, I've had a long standing earnings forecast for December 2022 of 53 cents a share and many in the market thought I was mentally insane coming out of that number. But as I've just said, at the interim stage, for 27.5 cents, which is basically half my forecast. So uh, perhaps my long term prognosis, having covered this company for the best part of 20 years, uh, is coming into play. I'm then forecasting going forward that peak capex in Kuro will be in 2023. They'll spend about 1.1 billion rand this year and about a billion rand next year. And then the total investment that Kuro will have made enrolling at his campus network in this country will be 14 billion rand, much of it financed through rights issues and latterly by debt. With the capex done and dusted and the schools rapidly filling up with learners, at the interim stage, we had just over 71,000 learners. We get what's called the J-curve and utilization effect, where as the schools start filling up with learners, and I'll always remember what Dr. Chris van der Merwe, the founder of Curro and Stardio, told me many years ago. He said, Anthony, a school generally makes most of its money with a last child's bum on a seat in a class. So if you think of it logically, if you've got a class that can take 20 learners and the teacher is there, the infrastructure is there, the lights are on, the internet is on, you're paying rates and taxes, et cetera, et cetera. If there's 15 children, the fixed cost is still there. When you get to 20 children, that incremental extra bums on seats starts becoming pure profit. And that's what Kuro is now rapidly working on, capacity utilization fulfillment. And I see that being a key tenant in Kuro's growth over the next few years. I recently met with Andreas Kreling, uh, the CEO, and he confirmed that over the next couple of years, their growth will start to moderate in terms of new schools. Their aim is to fill up existing schools. Another interesting little tidbit to keep an eye on the share price is that tomorrow there is a, an institutional site visit to three of the Kuro operations here in Cape Town. Uh, one of their core campuses in Durbanville, which was one of their founding 
uh, primary and secondary schools, which is one of their flagships. They're then going to Meridian School, which is a mid-end school, and then they go to a, to a technology school in Delft. So keep an eye on the share price because institutions will get to kick the tires tomorrow and see what's going on in, in this brand. The first site visit they have done in many years. I've seen the assets, so I know exactly what's coming. So I, I would say that Kuro to me looks a very interesting proposition. The key to Kuro is a bit like Carp Agri. When PSG unbundled its stake, it owned 64% of Kuro Holdings. That equates to 380 million shares were suddenly sloshing around the market trying to find a home. Now, if you're an institution and you already had a stake in Kuro, you're probably now going to be significantly overweight. Do you reallocate? Do you sell? Or do you hang on? So I'm expecting ongoing volatility in the share price as institutions start rebalancing their portfolios and the thousands of PSG shareholders who suddenly got Kuro shares, which who perhaps they didn't want them or they don't know what to do, or perhaps they already had some shares and they want to buy more. There's going to be volatility in the share price. I recommended about six weeks ago at 10 Rand and two cents. But Kuro to me, post the PSG unbundling, it was going to be one of the most attractive assets to look at because of its volatility. And I'm remaining with that stance. So what did I do when I got my uh, unbundled shares from PSG? So I sold my PSG consult because I didn't want to be in financial services in this country. I would much rather be in financial services of an offshore element because domestically, I just don't like the domestic financial services industry. Uh, secondly, I sold some of my Kuro shares because I was overweight in one of my pension funds, but I bought more in a, in a second pension fund, which was significantly underweight. So I'm now overweight Kuro. I bought more Stardio shares, which I think is a compelling argument. And I also bought more C, A and S, which is this African-based consumer company. So to reiterate my last two calls, I have a buy on Carp Agri and I have a buy on Kura Holdings. And Kura Holdings to me right now, if my crystal ball comes true, uh, is my strongest conviction call in my small to mid cap universe. I cover around 80 companies. And when I put a high conviction on something, it is because I truly believe that the analysis that I've done and the prognosis that I see in growth on the company will transpire over the next 12 to 18 months. Time will prove me right or will prove me wrong. The last two companies that came out of a PSG unbundling were Stadio, which is a tertiary education company, um, a company that I've favored for a number of years because it's asset light. What that basically means is most of it's online education in the tertiary space. People who actually want to learn post their matric, uh, either on a part-time basis or on a contact basis, um, they have a, a lot lower cost of infrastructure because most of their learning is done online, a bit like what UNISA uh, undertakes currently with their 350,000 learners, which means their total capex to date in acquiring the assets to launch the suite of educational platforms they have in the tertiary space will have only have cost about 2.5 billion rand. Now, I estimate, again, in this financial mail note, but when Kuro and Stagio reach their both intended goals, Kuro will have spent 14 billion rand, Stagio will have spent 3 billion rand, but the profitability of both companies will be roughly equal at around half a billion rand. Now, that's the benefit of being an online business where it's clicks rather than bricks that makes the money. So if I really wanted to be in a long-term educational play, I would only want to be in Stadio because so far um, the company is making all of its budgetary targets. It has never once asked for a cent from a market. It is purely self-funding. Cash on hand currently is 67 million rand. CapEx this year is extremely low. And we only have two campuses, one in Cape Town and one in Centurion in Johannesburg. There may be a second one in Cape Town in due course, but that is some way away. and will probably only cost 300 million rand, which will be bought into phases. That can easily be funded from existing cash flow. So by 2026, Stardio aims to have 56,000 learners and a profitability of 500 million rand. As it stands at the last interim results, uh, they've got 38,000 learners. And I think from memory, they, they made 145 million rand. So to me, Stardew is probably going to make its 2026 targets 
slightly earlier than the market expectations. Given it has no debt and the earnings growth is actually um, doing quite well, it was 17% at the interim stage. What will then happen as a company reaches its targets? It'll start generating significant amount of cash, which means great dividends to shareholders. So again, I reiterate, if I only wanted to be in one education stock for the longer term for any pension fund or portfolio, I would buy Stadio. One, because you'll never have to give it a cent. Two, the earnings growth is there because tertiary education will always have a place in this economy as learners seek to upskill for existing qualifications or perhaps the state system uh, is, uh, is basically falling apart as we know. And the natural target market is UNISA. UNISA has 350,000 learners. Its service delivery is not that great. And here's a statistic that was given to me last week. The single largest educational course inside UNISA is education. People training to become some form of teacher. That's 110,000 learners out of of 350,000 total uh, online learners. Stardew have 38,000 online learners of which 11,000 are studying education. So I thought, well, if you pick up just 10% of the education learners um, in UNISA, that can double the underlying star job base just in education. There's a thought for you to lay, to lay your hat on, showing you that the underlying runway for star Joe remains quite aggressive. The last stock that came out of the unbundling was C, A, and S. Excuse me once again. CANS is a reiteration of a company that I used to follow many, many years ago called CAA. It basically takes goods that are made in this country, particularly groceries, alcohol, and other related consumer goods, and it distributes them into uh, the Southern African ter- territorial region. Now, that may not sound glamorous, but in many cases, you know, in this country, when a manufacturer, let's pick a company like Tiger Brands, when it makes tastic rice or ku baked beans, it's generally delivered to a large distribution center and is then sent out in large trucks to the large retailers in, the, in this country like Pick and Pay, Checkers, Spa, et cetera, et cetera. The same isn't really true for Africa, where there's a much more informal retail element. And as such, goods are not as easily distributed in the Southern African region as they are in this country. One, because the infrastructure is not as good, Secondly, the formal retail structure is not as developed, and the mass of the retailing sector occurs on the informal basis, where the underlying stallholders or you know, shop owners only buy small quantities. They're not going to buy a warehouse full of baked beans. They're going to buy what they can afford for that particular day or that particular week, which means you need to have a specific distribution channel and relationships to deal with what could be tens of thousands of smaller individual storekeepers or resellers in Southern Africa. CANS does that excellently well. Recent results for the interims to June saw earnings of 31 cents. The current share price, as I look right now, is 5 rand 40. So if they double their interim numbers, the second half does tend to be better because of the festive trading period. There's a very high likelihood but the price earnings ratio of CANS will probably be between eight and nine times. Now you show me a retailer in this country which has a consistent quality of earnings growth and an aggressive expansion uh, trajectory that's trading on an eight or a nine. Uh, I don't think you'll find one. CANS is little followed. I think I'm the only analyst that is covering the stock. And I cover the stock because as I mentioned earlier, There was an old listed company called CAA. CAA, also bankrolled by PSG, was sold many years ago for a small fortune to Imperial. And the same team behind CAA is now running CANS. So they have the expertise, the contacts, and the skill set to develop another very profitable, very sizable business. So CANS to me is one of those undiscovered little gems which is very volatile because of the liquidity event of PSG unbundling around 45% of their stock, and it's it's settling down. I think at 5 Rand 40, I would keep a very, very close eye on CANS. Again, for a long-term growth portfolio, 
who are prepared to take the risk of investing in what is a Southern African based distribution network in the FMCG, which is fast moving consumer goods. Uh, it's one that I would certainly put on my radar screen and my watch list. So just to, uh, to update you all of the stocks that I've mentioned, I have a buy on Carp Agri, I have a buy on Curo, I have a buy on Stadio, and I have a buy on CAA. And I'm very confident that those stocks as an independent entities will have a, a very good growth profile over the next three to five years. I had distinctly left out PSG Consult because I'm not a fan of financial services companies. And I'd much rather invest in, uh, in other more diversified financial services companies. So I've just stuck with, the, stuck with the industrial counters that I cover quite closely. So I'm hoping my half an hour wrap in that area will, uh, will interest you. I'm going to move on to some further stocks right now after another sip of my coffee. Another stock which may interest uh, those value players, uh, which has been much in the news for last uh, 12 months, has been Distel and HCI. Now, I'm going to start with Distel. Distel is currently trading at 176 Rand and 6 cents. Now, the share price hasn't really gone anywhere, but it actually has. Uh, Distel, you got a board a few weeks ago at about 170 Rand, and it's now at 176. And you may think that is utterly unremarkable. Why am I going to put my money into, into Distel when it's only gone up like, you know, basically a one or two percent in a, in a couple of weeks? The answer is extremely simple. I've written a note on this again in this week's, sorry, in next week's financial mail as my pick of the month as a special situation value trap. Now, anyone who's followed the Distel uh, news will realize that Heineken, the European brewer, made an offer of 180 rand a share to buy out Distel. That is comprised of 160 rand, sorry, 165 rand for the core assets, and then 15 rand a share for the remaining assets, which is basically the spirits business of Gordon's gin and some Scottish whiskey. So at 176 rand, you are basically getting 165 rand in cash, and the balance is trading at 11 rand and six cents, but Heineken will guarantee to pay 15 rand for it. So there's an arbitrage opportunity there. Um, where's my little calculator? Between 15 and 11. There's an arbitrage opportunity of around 36%. But I'm not playing the arbitrage. I'm playing the longer game. Now, inside what will be called Cape Vin, uh, the market value of that company is around 2 billion rand. There are some very, very interesting assets. Now, I've covered Distel and its varying um, holding companies, Cape Vin, Cape Vin Holdings, Cape Vin Investments, KWV, for the best part of 25 years. And the Cape Vin rump, um, to me, is one of the most compelling and interesting market plays currently for value-based investors. Why do I say that with such a degree of confidence? Because international liquor assets and brands are inherently valuable. Gordon's Gin is a number one selling gin in this country. It is immensely profitable, and it has been immensely profitable for the best part of 40 years. Cape Vin also has a number of single malt and blended malt businesses based in Scotland. The value in whiskey isn't just in selling the product to the consumer and making a profit. It's on the inherent value of the underlying stocks that you have in your sellers in Scotland, which as they age become increasingly more valuable. Now, we all know that buying three-year-old whiskey and 20-year-old whiskey has significantly different price points. So as those barrels sitting in Scotland are aging, they become inherently more valuable. That asset base is currently worth two and a half billion rand. And as I indicated earlier, the current market value of all of Cape Vin is only two billion. And Cape Vin is immensely profitable. So I'm suggesting that anybody who's buying Distel right now, who takes 165 Rand a share in cash and hangs on to a rump, could end up with a very, very um, alcoholic investment in the years to come, as those underlying assets start generating very good profits, leading to very good dividends. And there's also a sideline. Gordon's Gin is actually owned by the international liquor company called Diageo. Back in the day, it used to be called Grand Metropolitan, and they have tried for decades 
to wrest that brand away from Distel. But under a 1978 grandfather agreement legal um, precedent, they've been unable to get that brand back from Distel. So they still have it. So at some point, perhaps Diageo wanted to consolidate his global empire, will come back and bid to try and buy Cape Vin to get his hands on Gordon's gin. And of course, the whiskey assets, which are inherently valuable. In the last results, which I attended, the finale, per se, of Distel, um, the Cape Vin rump disclosed uh, some very interesting turnover numbers and profitability numbers. And I would urge anybody to have a glance through the Distel results and to try and pick up for yourself well, what you think is going to happen with Distel. I, for one, am a Distel shareholder, and I'm certainly hanging on to my Cape Vin shares. I personally value Cape, Cape Vin at 30 rand a share, and its current implied value is a red 11 rand and 6 cents. I may be completely wrong here, but I know liquor companies, and I've been covering them for many, many years, and I see significant value uh, currently trapped inside Distel because the market here is missing a beat. And uh, by the time this thing actually occurs, I expect rump to start re-rating. So perhaps if you buy the Stell now at 176 and hang on to the rump, you may do quite well and uh, take a wee dram for yourself in a few years time if my scenario uh, actually pans out. Another stock which I've been uh, recommending since early February this year has been HCI. Buskins Consolidated Investments. Uh, is an amalgamation of a number of assets in this country revolving around gaming, hotels, leisure, transport, manufacturing, and other related assets. It owns Soho Sun, uh, it owns Southern Sun Hotels, in Cape Town it owns Golden Arrow and My City Bus. Uh, it has a manufacturing arm called the Neb, which makes automotive parts for one for Volkswagen. And then it also has a, a stake in ETV, which you all know is the synonymous and has a leading market share in terrestrial television in this country. But it also has subsidiary assets involved in coal, platinum, and some very interesting oil assets. Many years ago, HCI took a stake in an offshore company called Africa Oil. And Africa Oil had a subsidiary stake in a company called Impact Oil and Gas. So on a look-through basis, HCI owns around 10% of this offshore oil business. Now, this offshore oil business had invested many years ago in oil blocks off the coast of Namibia and off the southern coast of the trans -Sky. In early February this year, there were rumors emanating from some oil blocks that I cover or follow in the UK that Total Energy one of the world's largest oil companies, which is French, by the way, had discovered a huge new deposit uh, off the coast of Namibia. That block was called Venus. Uh, that block happened to be the one that HCI had an indirect 10% stake in. The share price at that point, when I discovered that little tidbit of information, was trading at around 80 rand a share. When HCI itself eventually uh, announced to the market that Total Energy had potentially struck it big off the coast of Namibia. Uh, that was on the 24th of February. The share price was over 100 rand. By the end of April, it was at 167 rand. And as I, as I sit here today, speaking to you, excuse me, it's at 180 cents and 81 rand. So its discount net asset value has gone from a significant discount. It's now trading at about a 6% premium because the market is wondering what this potential oil stake could be worth. Now, as it stands right now, the US investment bank Jefferies is marketing HCI stake uh, for potential sale. What is currently going on is that Total Energy will be drilling a second well, hopefully by the end of this year, to prove what the flow rate of that significant discovery could be. Initial indications are that well could hold 3 billion barrels of oil. It could be significantly more. I'm told the size of a deposit is the same area as uh, Greater London, and the depth of, a, of the basin of a deposit is the height of Big Ben, or 100 meters. So it's a large, shallow basin, potentially full of extremely high-quality oil. 
The reason why a second test well is being drilled is one to prove that the actual well is viable, which it is, and what the, what the flow rate could be. Now, the reason why that is significantly important is as you reach varying milestones in the development of a, of a new exploration, firstly, when it's discovered, there's a value, generally one or two rand a share. Then when you, when you can prove how much oil is in the ground, a second value occurs. And then thirdly, if you can prove how much oil is in the ground, how much is recoverable, you get another value. And then the next stage after that is once you've proved how much oil is in the ground, how much is recoverable, what the flow rate is. Now, initial indications suggest that this could be a million barrels a day. And of a current oil price, that is $90 million a day in potential revenue. So why is all of this interesting? Because that's the reason why the HCI share price is running. The market is trying to work out what its 10% stake in one of the largest discoveries of oil in recent memory could be worth. Wood McKenzie, who is a leading international oil expert, has got a very wide range. Uh, if you extrapolate out HCI's potential stake, it can be worth anything between 9 and 20 billion rand, which is significantly in excess of a current HCI market value. HCI also has debt at the center. So if they do sell the stake, and I was at the HCI annual general meeting uh, two weeks ago, where Johnny Copeland stated categorically by the next AGM in 2023, they will know what this Venus stake is potentially worth. And within two years, it will be sold. And the money either reinvested back into HCI to repay debt and or potentially unbundle the company or buy out many of the listed subsidiaries like eMedia, Frontier Transport, Deneb, and the like. So I think HCI to me has a number of very interesting touch points. One, it is it's is still a value play. Make no doubt the easy money has been made. I would not be aggressively running into HCI at 181 Rand for the oil play. You could have bought this thing six months back on my recommendation in the 80 Rands. But everything is now to play for regarding what the stake could be worth in the next 12 months. And that'll keep the share price elevated. As the underlying assets inside HCI continue to recover post a pandemic with greater tourism, greater leisure activity, I mean, industrial heartland of this country, hopefully picking itself up from its knees, um, the underlying portfolio should also perform extremely well. So basically, I see, I see HCI as a very interesting company with a, with a very lucrative oil option currently priced into the market, but perhaps not fully priced. So it's certainly one to keep an eye on. So as I said, it's all now to play for, but at 181 Rand, if I had some, I'd hang on to it. If I didn't have any, I might take a nibble, but I certainly wouldn't put Granny's pension fund into the stock, given you could have bought this company six months ago at 80 Rand a share. I'm going to wind up in a matter of minutes but I, by going through some interesting counters which have been topical in the market latterly. Um, Omnia, the fertilizer and explosive companies, is currently trading at 66 rand 53 cents. Now, I've been recommending that stock uh, on my social media play, page at Small Talk Daily, if anybody's seen it, for quite some time. Uh, the share price bottomed at 60 rand probably about two weeks ago, but it is off a high of 85 rand. Uh, when it reached 85 Rand, earnings were spectacular, and they gave you an 8 Rand special dividend. So the share price has unwound because the market believes that Omnia will not be a beneficiary uh, given that global fertilizer prices have weakened uh, year on year. And they think that the underlying prospects for fertilizer and explosives are not that great. Um, I think the market is completely wrong. Uh, I've covered the agricultural sector for the best part of 20 years and I've covered Omnia, Omnia for just as long. I have an extremely good relationship with management and I track the underlying soft commodities and the agricultural components and the fertilizer molecules extremely closely. I put an 11 page note out yesterday on this very subject. It is my belief that Omnia once again for its September interims and its March uh, finals will show very good growth year on year 
it certainly will not be as spectacular as last year when the underlying fertilizer price more than doubled because of known global supply chain issues. We have the Russian-Ukrainian issue in February, which caused uh, sanctions to choke off uh, much of the world's supply of potash, uh, phosphates, and ammonia, leading to significantly higher prices for fertilizer companies. Lastly, we've had the European gas crisis. Uh, as I was listening to CNBC before I came on this call, the European wholesale gas price year to date is up 180%, which means that many ammonia plants in Europe have now shut down because they can't make any money, which means the fertilizer prices to me will remain elevated because the key molecules remain extremely high and the underlying raw materials are simply not available. What we are seeing right now is a lull in the fertilizer market. The Northern Hemisphere planting system actually ended in about April to May this year. So then naturally fertilizer prices tends to weaken until the Southern Hemisphere starts to plant, which is October onwards, when Australia, Southern Africa, and particularly South America starts to plant and prices once again start to tick up. We then start looking forward into the, into the winter and spring of 2023. And again, the Northern Hemisphere starts to plant. So whilst fertilizer uh, year on year is down off its best, it's still up year to date 60%. 60%. So make no doubt, Omni will still be making very good money on its underlying fertilizer business. And the early indications I have is that the underlying intentions to plant this year will be as good as last year. And with the elevated prices of soft commodities, with maize currently trading at about 4,750 rand a ton, despite the input costs year on year for a farmer, being up between 50 and 70% comprising fertilizer, field chemicals, and diesel, they will still plant because the underlying return per hectare of crop remains extremely profitable. And if, if farmers plant, they have to use chemicals, they have to use fertilizer. So I'm expecting Omnia to come up with a pretty good trading update for its September uh, interim period, and again, its March year end. And a couple of tidbits, uh, next, Thursday in Cape Town, they're hosting an institutional day regarding the agricultural and biostimulant side. And I think that'll kick up some very interesting information regarding one of the fastest growing elements inside Omnia, which is their organic nutrients division. Uh, so all in all, I'm very happy to recommend Omnia at 66 Rand 53. One stock I know that is very popular uh, amongst the social media classes and the private client investor base is Renogen. The share price as I speak is at 32 Rand and 10 cents and is of its best. You know, the share price laterally on the back of the uh, anticipation, anticipation of Virginia phase one coming on stream uh, ran to about 38, 39 Rand. Uh, it's since weakened because the markets as a whole, you know, is also, uh, is also down. And there's been a great deal of misinformation regarding Renogen. Um, if I had to get a, a, a gold coin for every spurious or inaccurate story that I read online regarding this, com regarding this company, trust me, I'd be a very rich man. And I'd be sitting here with piles of Krugerrands around me. I've had comments back to me that oh, they can't extract helium uh, from the free state because it's difficult to get. And I say, well, clearly you don't understand the, uh, the gaseous composition of how to extract helium from methane. Uh, I've had comments that the, the plant is not working properly. Uh, well, they've already announced to you the plant is working and it's working perfectly well. Uh, the helium production will start imminently because a very small impeller, uh, literally the size of a, of a very small top, uh, which costs $80,000, uh, is, currently, is currently being installed. And that tiny little impeller spins at enormous velocity and it pressurizes the gas to enable the extraction of that helium. So as it stands right now, Renogen has already told you they're filling up their tanks with LNG. Ital Tile has already told me and I've already told my institutional clients that they're accepting uh, LNG into their system. And then Consul Glass was another client of, uh, of Renogen will come on stream probably around November this year. So all of the misinformation I've seen consistently on Renogen 
is from people simply who do not understand the story. They've either not visited a plant, they do not understand the dynamics of, uh, of, of gaseous physics, or they are just looking to make stories for their own ends. If you're going to be in a stock, particularly a stock like Renogen, which has come from a, a stage in 2015 where it was looking for gas to a point where it was discovering gas to a point it's now beginning to extract and commercially operate a significant gas operation, you're not going to be in this business for five minutes. Renogen to me is a company which is in an evolving stage of development. The Virginia Phase 2 um, EPC will start coming on stream in 2023 and make no doubt there will be some capital raise at some point, but probably in the next couple of years. Renogen already has $700 million of committed capital through debt to actually fund Virginia Phase 2. And I'm working it out right now. So out of a, out of a 12 to 15 billion rand project, they already have 12.4 billion rand in committed debt facilities. So the amount of new equity that they may have to raise is actually extremely small in the scope of a project. When the project starts to operate in mid-2026, we will see a rapid uplift in the output of LNG and in helium. And I then foresee in the years to come, given the low operating cost of Renogen of around 800 million rand a year, this business will become extremely cash generative and will start to repay the significant debt load that it has rather quickly. And I can see then significant dividends being paid. So is Renogen you know, a stock for widows and orphans? It never has been. It's a stock for those that have a belief that the long-term potential of developing this site in the free state will start paying significant profits and dividend generation from 2026 to 2030 onwards. Now, that may sound like a long time away, and it is, but in market parlance, it takes sometimes a decade to two decades to bring a significant oil discovery on stream. Um, HCI indicated to me the cost of developing that well off the coast of Namibia could be between 70 to $80 billion to develop that significant oil prospect. It's a long-term investment game in oil, which leads to long-term returns and decent cash flow when production starts. So to me, at 32 rand and 10 cents, am I concerned about Renogen? Absolutely not. Am I a shareholder? Yes, I am. Am I, am I worried at night? No. I bought this stock uh, for my long-term pension portfolio for the profits, accrual, and dividends of this company will start to generate in the years to come. Uh, at that point, I don't know if anybody wants to ask questions. If they want to type anything, if I can pick it up, I might pick up some questions for there's just me online. So I'm going to open up my Q&A and see what has popped up. So give me a second and I'll see what I can pick up here. Okay, first question from Adam. What is your target price for Cura Holdings? Uh, it's in my financial mail article, 16 Rand a share. Uh, Anthony, what is your view on Renogen? Buy and hold longer term. Uh, absolutely. My target price, which I've written consistently in articles that I've put out so far this year, my long-term target price is 60 Rand. And I'm, and I'm, I'm not changing that view. Um, Anthony, thank you for a great presentation. Any large caps that you're looking at of a current, looking at, a, at with a current market decline? Um, I've mentioned Omnia. I've mentioned Distel, and I've mentioned HCI. Uh, in terms of other mark, large market caps, um, Advertech, I think it's a great story in education, uh, but I prefer uh, Kuro and Stadio. Afrimat is at 48 Rand 70. Uh, that's unwound because of a decline in the iron ore price. Uh, I did some work earlier. The iron ore price right now is trading at $98.80 which is a rand equivalent of 1,752 rand a ton. Now in May, when iron ore was $160 a ton and the rand was at 1576, iron ore was at 2,522 rand a ton, showing you in the last four to five months that the iron ore price in rand is down 31%. That's the reason why Afrimat and Cumber have fallen in a heap. They're not gonna have great earnings results going forward because of the material decline in iron ore. In Afrimat's case, I'm not uh, too concerned. It's an extremely well-run business. It has a diversified portfolio. 
And despite the fact that their manganese operation has been curtailed because they couldn't get the water rights, they will expand their Uncomari coal and their Glenover phosphate and rare earths business. So if I see further weakness in Afrimet, and I do foresee further weakness, given what's going on in the iron ore price, and the fact it's an August interim results period, and a trading update is coming out, and I'm not expecting a brilliant trading update, it'll be okay, but it certainly will not shoot the lights out. Um, I, would use, I would use any weakness in Afrimet in the mid 40s to accumulate a stake in one of the best run companies that I see and cover in the mid cap space, whose current market value is roughly seven or eight billion rand. Uh, let me scroll down here. Uh, again from Adam, do you think the Omnia chemical segment might be up for sale? Yes. Uh, again, I'm on public record, but Protea Chemicals uh, is non-core, I believe, to Omnia. Uh, it is my view that the margins currently are a suboptimal. They have improved year on year to around four, four and a half percent, but they are significantly below the targets that Omnia wants to attain. They've exited a lot of the bulk commodities and are now in specialty chemicals. And it is my personal view, as I've written in numerous uh, articles, both for my clients and uh, for the financial press, that two divisions of Omnia, to me, have potential for M&A. One is the Australian Humates business, which is the, which is the organic fertilizer business, which I think could be worth 24 Rand a share, if not more, if sold. And then Protea Chemicals could potentially be worth eight Rand a share. So on a 66 Rand share price, I can see it between 30 and 32 Rand a share potentially coming in due course from asset sales. Will they occur? Who knows? Do I see them coming in the next two to three years? Yes, I do. But I certainly would not be buying Omnia on the, on the hope that transactions will propel the share price. I would buy Omnia because it's an extremely well-run company with an improving margin base, with great operational efficiencies coming, and the potential for further uplift via special dividends and ongoing asset sales. Let me scroll down. Any thoughts on coal potash? Sorry, I don't cover that stock. Any views on purple? No, I don't cover purple. Uh, you've uh, uh, Anthony Renegen. Uh, hi, Anthony. Renegen, great company. However, risk of expl explosions as in US production plant and gas from plants, risk the reward. Listen, um, any form of um, volatile chemical or gaseous operation globally always has the risk. One of the reasons why Renogen delayed the, um, uh, the production of Virginia phase one, which was due to come on stream in April and May, is they rigorously tested every single component in that plant. And only when they fought, it was absolutely 100% safe that they actually switch on the plant. And in that period, the market got very pissed off that the plant wasn't operating. But you have to understand, in any form of volatile and hazardous environment, you have to backtest everything. So is there a risk? Of course there is. Is it small? Sure. Could it happen? Who knows? But I think Renogen, like any other um, reputable and, um, and uh, decent company, always puts the safety of its employees and its business uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a number one paramount uh, pedestal list. So uh, I don't see that as being a, a risk issue, but I would say, well, I'm selling Renogen because it may have a plant a fire. It's like me saying, well, you know what? I'm going to sell all my food companies because there, there may be a, bibli a biblical plague. So to me, it's, it's a non-issue. Um, can you just repeat all the shares mentioned? Sure. Um, Afrimat, Kuro, Distel, HCI, Omnia, Renogen, Stadio, C, A, and S. Uh, any thoughts on the C, A, uh, the combined motor holdings upcoming results? Yes. Uh, it's currently trading at 29 Rand. Um, I've been aggressively um, recommending this stock from 12 Rand. I have a target price of 36 and then 42. And I think the recent MOTUS results, uh, which were truly spectacular, uh, show you that if MOTUS is doing well, uh, CMH is doing just as well. And I think that uh, with the launch of the Proton vehicle, uh, the ongoing demand for, the, for car rental in this country, and the consumer's desire to buy affordable cars, and they, they've been trading down, 
uh, with, the, with the lower sales numbers from Mercedes, BMWs, et cetera, et cetera, which plays right into CMH's hands because they, they retail Suzuki, Haval, Cherry, Ford, Mazda, Nissan. Um, Suzuki, as a, matter, as a matter of interest, was the second best-selling car in, in July and the third best-selling car in August, showing how the affordability of consumers' preferences towards motor vehicles on the new side is beginning to play in CMH's favor. So CMH to me remains a compelling buy, and I will once again uh, lay a small side bet that when the trading update comes up, the share price will run and the market will say, well, where did that come from? And I will say it comes from the fact that they're doing well and didn't you see the motor's numbers? Anthony, again from Clyde, what is your view on SABCAP? I'm going to buy on SABCAP since 28 Rand. Uh, it is now trading at around uh, 74 Rand from memory. Uh, it's invested all its cash. Its recent transactions were a 20% stake in a liquor company called Halewood International, and it took out a stake in ARB Holdings, an electrical equipment company. Um, the discount net asset value is circa 30%. They recently came out with an extremely good net asset value increase rise year on year to 103 Rand. And I've raised my year end net asset value target to a minimum of 115 Rand. Uh, I maintain my buy on the SAB cap. And I, I will again reiterate, as I've written in, in my institutional notes and in my online uh, press commentary, if I owned a portfolio and I wanted exposure to small to mid cap companies in, an, in a listed and unlisted space, and I could only own one share, I would only buy a SAB cap. The management of that company has been superb in actually selecting assets which have consistent growth in earnings and dividends. So you are basically investing alongside the founder and CEO of that business, Christopher Seabrook, who has over 30 years experience of either managing or running companies. So again, I will reiterate, if I only had to own one share to get exposure to the private equity of a small to mid cap space, I would only buy SABCAP. Uh, what is your view on Rhodes Foods Group? Easy, I don't like it. I, I've never liked it. It's overvalued and I prefer to be in Libstar, which is trading currently in a P of 7.1. Uh, do you cover coal stocks? Sorry, no, I don't. Views on Wissizwe Platinum, it's in my top five. It's back to 106 cents a share. I'm waiting for the results to come out to June. They are late. When that comes out, I will uh, update my views. Uh, what is your Santova view considering the potential of a global recession? Santova has been a stock that I've recommended for quite some time. It's been one of my best performers uh, year to date. But as I told a client this week when he asked me, would I be buying Santova at current levels? The answer was no, for one easy reason. I hate chasing companies where the easy money has been made. The stock has had a significant run in the last six to 12 months. And I hate chasing companies despite the fact they may still look reasonable. So, you know, a chance of a global recession, yes, but let's not uh, discount the fact that global supply chain systems and ports have been in flux, in congestion, and been disrupted for the best part of two years. We also have problems in China with a hard COVID lockdown, also making the movements of goods internationally very difficult. So I think Santova in the longer term will continue to do well and probably will do slightly better as the global supply chain situation and port situation you know, normalizes in the next 12 to 18 months. I'll take one last question from Mark Harrington. Hi, Anthony, many thanks for a great presentation. Your thoughts on Zida, easy, sell. It's trading at one Rand 86, it's got two assets left, Cape Vin, um, sorry, Cape Span and Zod. Uh, they're gonna be tricky, difficult assets to sell. And why do I want to, to invest in a company or hold a company where nothing could potentially happen for 12 to 18 months? I would rather take my money and reinvest it into other areas. So if I had to be as bold right now, I would sell my Zeta and I would buy Carp Agri. On that note, I've gone past my one hour time limit. Um, thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you all for your questions. And I hope uh, Gary and Pascal will have me back at some point. I think our next uh, online webinar is going to be, I think, in the middle of November. Otherwise, any queries that you have, uh, go back to your contacts in Rand Swiss. I'm sure they'll assist you. And as you know, 
uh, much of my content will be will be and is available uh, on the Rand, on the Rand Swiss uh, website. From me here in Cape Town, have a fantastic day. Keep safe, and hopefully, load shedding doesn't kill your day. Take care.